Alafi, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Candid Conversation with Dr. Delbert Blair. And I feel very privileged to have you because I know that you are a very busy person and spend a lot of time counseling and other people and studying and doing things other than sitting around talking to people on television that want to ask you personal questions. Hmm. But I'm sure you're not going to answer any questions that, that you don't want to anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you know me, Dr. Gloria Lattimore. Peace, it's my pleasure again to see you. And I have to give you a compliment. I think you get younger with the days. Well, thank you very much. You're more than welcome again. All right. And if anybody knows you, and I know half the people in Chicago do, they know again that I'm not exaggerating to say you're a gem, a shining star, and have been for you a few days. Okay, that's <laughs> a paid political advertisement, mm -hmm. audience. Now, Delbert Blair, I'm going, I told you before I'm going to ask you about <laughs> you because a lot of people mm. know you in a sense that they know your work, but they don't know you. And I asked you if you were a native Chicagoan, and you said yes, and that you were educated here. And I asked you a question about when you took off on a tangent and decided to self-educate and learn a lot of things that most of us don't even know we don't know. And you said you put in almost a half century. That's about right. So now tell me what motivated you. Dr. Peace, in 1961, I had a life-changing experience. And if anyone had gone through what I went through, they would either be a fool not to do what I did after that, or they'd be in denial and try to hide it. Um, it's a long story. I have it on tape, and I didn't talk about it for about 18 years, except for a few people who knew what had happened. Um, I used to, when I was in undergrad school and all, I was into UFOs and the study of what is this and why are we here and where do we come from and where are we going. Those are basic questions that all ones uh, anybody who reaches a time of contentment or a time of exasperation must ask. I went to a UFO symposium, and there was a man, a Polish man by the name of George Adamski, who I had read a lot of uh, books about, and I was very impressed by what he said. So he was at a downtown hotel. I went in on a Friday, and I thought he was speaking that night. He wasn't. And was, I'm going to skip a lot of the story, but uh, I wound up just crashing in on a press interview on the mezzanine of that floor. That's just how um, exuberant, let's put it like that, uh, I was at that time. The man knew me from nothing. He was white, I was black, and I was young, he was middle-aged, and he had money and I had, I had none. So we wound up talking, as he told the uh, press reporters and his bodyguards, he knew me, so oh, that's who he cared. He didn't know me from Adam. But something about me or something about him allowed uh, me to do that. We wound up talking for about five hours till the sun came up. We started the conversation about 1 o'clock in the morning. He was late coming in the press him, And I explained to him, I thanked him for doing what he did. And he said, well, I just kind of tuned to you. I remember you said that ex explicitly. And then um, I said, well, I'm sorry that I missed you. I'm a student. I can't come back tomorrow when you do speak. He said, don't worry about it. Come back tomorrow. I'll have your name on the list. I came back the next night. And as usual, when things like this happen, I'm always usually alone because the people didn't want to run with me and didn't want to come to any UFO symposium. I came back the next morning, I mean the next night, and having spent with him, time with him to the next morning again, I didn't feel I should take up any more of his time. Well, he not only had my name there, but I came into the lecture. After the lecture, I looked around, there were around 380 people in there and three blacks. Of them, they were both males outside of myself. So after uh, the lecture was over, they all kind of mobbed him and were asking him questions. Since I had spent so much time before, I thought it wasn't my place. I'll wait. So I saw the two black guys and figured that they might live in the hood. And here's somebody finally that looked like me, that had an interest like me. So I ran on over to the brother, you know, hey, man. The guys looked at me. One was about 6'2". The other one was about 5'8". There was a difference in height. At any rate, the guys just asked me like I wasn't even there. I said, hey, bro, you know, said, so I said, okay, well, I get offended pretty easy. So after that, <laughs> I said, well, you know what you can do, you know. So I walked on over to the side, and then I looked, and there was a young lady who had been with Mr. Adamski, and I saw her standing there. So I kind of looked at her and said hi, and she acknowledged me. So I went over there, and I said, uh, you know, I spent so much time with you guys, I didn't want to take up any more time, and maybe you could 
further the conversation. Well, I'm looking at her, and I'm quite aware of what people do, so she's looking past me. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking up, anyway, these two guys are coming back over. And I said, okay, now I'm talking to a white woman, so now they're going to come over and talk with me. Remember, this is 61 now. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't even acknowledge me when I called him brother and all before, so now I'm on my high horse. You know, mm -hmm. you can't touch me. Long story short, they said they came a long way to see me. They didn't know it was me they were supposed to see. And they thought it was one of the people asking questions, and the time was limited. But now they said, any question I wanted answered, they would answer for me. Well, if you know me, I don't, you know, I don't play. You don't want to be bothered with me, I don't want to be bothered with you. So now I'm on my high horse. And the little guy, so whatever, they got past all of that stuff. And I spent some time uh, right there in this big auditorium. It held 300 and 400 people. And um, we're standing by the doorway. And about, oh, I, to me, it was about five minutes later, uh, we were talking, asking what was time, asked a lot of things. And their answers, and especially the big guy's answer, was very uh, uh, interesting. Then I looked up, and one of the things he said, you ask about time. I said, yeah. He said, did you look around you? And I'm looking around me, and then it hit me. Of all those 380 people in that auditorium, we're standing by the doorway, they're all out now, the last ones going and getting on the elevator, going down to think. I hadn't seen one of those people come by me. Uh -huh. Now, that's not Del Blair, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. So then I said, that's kind of strange. I said, I must have really got engrossed in that conversation. We went downstairs, and as we're getting on the elevator, uh, the, the woman, young lady, was a, that's the kind they had, the kind you had to level yeah. off of the floor and all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, this woman was a black woman, and she was in the elevator. Girl. So when he came over there, the little guy, the smaller guy, he came running up to her, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry again. And he's just acting on like this, you know, like nobody else is around. So sorry. So I'm already thinking this is a weird situation. So when we get on to the first floor, I said, pardon me, minute, guys, in a minute. I went back and said, hey, what's with this guy? You know, what was that? He says, well, when we came in, they had a couple of things going. Most black people don't come to conferences like this. Uh -huh. And as a consequence, I uh, was going up, and I went past where the UFO symposium, because they had a meeting of a lot of, you know, convention of black people. Okay. So, but this time, he said, no, I want to get off here. So I leveled it back and said, the man behind it said, you know, you blankly blankers, you know, uh -huh. always try to help each other or something like that. Uh -huh. And this guy went berserk. He said, he looked at him, he jumped in front of him and said, he, he was so quick at that movement. Uh -huh. And he said, he just looked at him. And he said, though he never heard racial prejudice before or something like this. So I said, well, there's some weird dudes here, uh -huh. but I just wonder what had happened. I'm trying to cut all this short. Um, anyway, one guy, the guy I talked, like I said, I'm talking now, he had a pretty booming voice. So we went through all these little things. And I said, well, this guy is answering questions that are kind of way out. Maybe it's best with his loud voice that I kind of step out to the street level. Uh -huh. So then we stood right outside. It was a summer day, summer night. So we stood outside there. I asked him what was a Negro. I asked him about time. I asked him a bunch of other things. Well, he, he did three things. One, I asked him the Negro. He says, I'll tell you that. He said, but I'll, in about 15 minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll tell you or show you what a Negro is. Uh -huh. About 15 minutes. I said, okay. Um, I asked him about time. I said, will you just see this experience, that one? And then uh, I asked him about something else. He said, well, Negro was the dead, the lost, the unknowing, and that's what it's really derived from. Uh, I started asking him something else, and when I started to do that, I thought that was a kind of a crazy question to ask this man. This man seems to have a whole lot of smarts, uh -huh. and I'm not going to ask that. And then he answered that. And then I'm thinking again, and then something said, you didn't say anything. You thought that and said you weren't going to say that to that man. That man answered your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Then I stepped back because if I hadn't known before I was in the wrong league, mm -hmm. I knew now I, <laughs> I was not in that league. Mm -hmm. And I remember tears jumping in my eyes and I said, I didn't say that to you. I said, I was thinking that. And I thought that other thing. Mm -hmm. The little guy just started laughing like mad. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, well, I told you I came a long way to see you. You're special. But there's one thing that he didn't seem to like about me. He asked me at least six times, what is your name? And I said, Delroy Blair. Uh -huh. That obviously was not what I was supposed to say. Of all that, he almost was expressionless. He didn't get, that seemed to perturb him. He kept asking me, do you know, not do you know, what is your name? Uh -huh. Who are you? And so on again like that. So after it, we talked for a long time. He also put up his watch, like, or put up his coat, like I have a watch uh -huh. on. I looked at this thing, something was pulsing, running around and all kind of crazy things, this big thing up there. And I said, what is that? He said, he said a chronometer. I said, oh, yeah, I got one of them in the house. <laughs> when I get kind of upset, I make fun. I kind of laugh when things are rough. So about this time, we hear a ha-ha, ho-ho-ho, coming around the corner is a bunch of Negroes. 
It was about 16 minutes after the time you told me in about 15 minutes I was sure it was mm -hmm. So what has happened? I lost time. I got some guys reading my mind. I got guys predicting the future. I got guys losing time with that and answering every question I ever had in my life. So then I'm only asking, I said, well, okay, I want to ask you where you're from because you are going to tell me, right? I said, I can come over and visit you sometime, you know. He said, you know that's not true, but so on and so forth. So the last thing I had with him, I said, well, I said, is there such a thing as UFO? I said, I've never seen one. I want to see one. He said, have you? He said, do you watch the sky? I said, I'm always watching the sky. He said, well, you watch it for the next week. I said, oh, in the next week. Then something said to myself, haven't you been smart enough? Aren't you going to shut up and understand this is a special time? So then I just shut up. I said, okay. Uh, they walked down the street. I had this urge to follow them. In my head, said, don't follow. In my head, something said, don't follow. Three days later, it was on a Tuesday night. I was living over at University of Chicago and University again, the campus. And I'm coming home from the movie. I'm looking up in the sky, and I see kind of three stars like moving. And you know, I could get a parallax. Sometimes you see something, and you really don't think I didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of easing back. And these daggone three stars were coming down in a row. If you saw that movie, Close Encounter of the Third Kind mm -hmm. on Devil's Mountain, that, that's just the way these things look. Oh, they were bright lights. Mm -hmm. And they went over what is called the quads there in University of Chicago. And I lived up on the second floor. I had just gotten married, and I had to make a decision. The way they were going so fast, by the time I went down the street to get to them, I figured they'd be gone. Mm -hmm. The gangway there was closed and boarded. I made mean, mm -hmm. a lock on it. So then I just bounded up the stairs. I think I never climbed some stairs so that fast. I'm knocking on the door. I couldn't get my keys out. So I'm knocking at it. My wife said, what's wrong? I said, just come on, follow me. So I ran through the house, ran on in the back porch, expecting to see these things disappearing. I went out there, and here are these three UFOs, just like in the movies, mm -hmm. all up there glittering and glowing. You could tell that you couldn't see them, all this field or whatever it was around them. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, and then I'm saying, hey, I'm nuts. The only thing I'll never forget, my wife saw them too, because I remember she, her last word to me, or not last, but at that time, you know, she said, what have you done now? And I said, well, my God, she sees them too. Mm -hmm. She said, I don't see this. And she ran back in the house. I'm looking at them. All of a sudden, one lights up, choo, gone. I don't know which direction. I can only assume it went out to my left, which at that time would have been north. The other one starts making zigzag, and for about 12 minutes, it's just zigzag. I'm watching this one and watching the other one. And then the other one began to fade out. What it was doing was going up and out, like going over the lake from that time on. So I've had many experiences after that, some of which nobody would believe. But that was a whole turnaround. Now, after seeing that, there's no way I could continue to do what I was doing. I want to be able to read minds. I want to be able to predict the future. I want to be able to ask all the questions in the world. And I want to be able to wonder what was that. And here, and this is the other thing that was very interesting. I went to the conference to, to see this man who was Polish. I wound up talking to two brothers or people that looked like me that did all these other things. I'm looking for white spacemen. I never thought about black spacemen. Mm -hmm. So then I started studying what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said about the mothership and black spacemen. I started reading things about black sp spacemen in the East. And then from that point on, because you know the history major anyway, that kind of tied it together. So that, of course, would change anybody's life. And I've had about, I won't go into all that, I've had about eight other things almost as good or bad. Well, how do you begin to study these things? Are there books in the library? Are there classes in the university? Where do you go? I asked him the same thing. Where do I study? He said, you go to a metaphysical bookstore. Mm. That was the first time I had heard the word metaphysics with an understanding of what metaphysics is. People still ask me, what's metaphysics? Well, I say, now, if you don't know, you're not supposed to know because it means you're, old, you're, not a new, you're a new soul, not an old one. But that's the same thing I asked him, and I asked him, where could I find one? He said, you see. That was another thing. I'm not going to go into detail on that one. But I was led at one time for about two years, any time I had a craving for chili, chili. And chili is, is OK. It's never been my favorite food. Something metaphysical was going to happen. And I remember one day I was at work. I, I had to do a lot of driving at the job I had that time before I started my own business. Um, I was driving. I had to search for chili. And it became an obsession for chili. So much so that uh, I was downtown near Erie and State, and I saw this chili place and I'm in my car. So by the time I went around three times, couldn't find a place to park. It was almost like coming down here, can't park anywhere. And I said, well, the next time I see a space, I don't care where it is, I'm going to park. And I parked in front of a fire plug, 
uh, about 20 feet from the sign where it was a bus stop. But the urge, almost like a druggie, the urge was so much I couldn't do anything else. So I jumped out the car, going to go to the chili parlor. It's like somebody put a goldfish bowl around me. I'm looking at the chili place, and I get out, and I'm walking around in front of the car to the passenger side. All the craving for chili went away. And it's just like I can only explain, like somebody put a, a glass hood or a plastic hood that I could see through over me. And right over there it said, a cult bookstore. Mm. That's how I found my first metaphysical bookstore. And the thing was so small, it was between a Kroger's and a tavern. It stayed near him. I never would have found it. And the dag on, on the door said, knock for admission. Had a candle burning. <laughs> That's it. All I need now is for a little old man with a beard to come up and beckon me in. <laughs> Do you? And it, you know. And I'll, I'll just say this again. About 30 seconds later, a little old man, not quite with a long beard, came up to the door and beckoned me in. I said, "I'm serious. Yeah, I'm not lying. I am not lying. I would not sit up here on television and say this kind of thing." Okay. And he kind of beckoned me, and I hit the door to knock. The door jumps open. That is how I got into my metaphysical bookstore. So you can begin to see. Um, I didn't talk about this for a long time. Now I talk about any old thing because our whole world is going crazy now if people only understood. But obviously I was led to do this. Uh -huh. Obviously if I had done anything other than this, it would not have been fulfilling whatever it was I'm supposed to do. I still don't know my name. And you know, I could have changed my name 50 times uh -huh. since I don't know what to change it to and nobody ever told me I haven't. But that's how I found out about that. And they had all the books I'd ever dreamed about. There's a river. Uh, the a book of a wasp, a book of the, uh, what's this other one, your rancher book, um, all kind of books. And that's how I got into it. And then you started teaching classes how long ago? Because you, you, I mean, I've, I've seen you at so many places, at your own home, uh, on, it seems to me, on 79th Street at a church. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had classes, they were always filled. When, when did you start? How long ago did you start doing oh, that? God, I, I registered and chartered in 1972. Before that time, I ad hoc. I actually registered the, the Meta Center with the state and became a corporate business and all this kind of thing. And then I, part of that was the teaching center and, um, a, re, and a spiritual institution because I wanted to be able to use the metaphysical church thing as a by, by, by too. So that was about it, 72. What was the, what was the goal of the Meta Center? I had actually a charted uh, goal that we laid out again, to teach peace of mind, health of body, understanding of life. Okay. And I said, if you could ever get all of those, you could find love, because then you'd be open for love, loving yourself, you could find love yourself. Mm -hmm. So I never said love, I said peace of mind, health of body, understanding of life, and turn which will get you love and better understanding of what you're here for. So <coughs> the approach to peace of mind is To understand enough where you're at peace trying to understand more. Knowledge becomes wisdom if you're on the right path. Uh -huh. Wisdom becomes stupidity if you don't even understand the knowledge that you did have. Uh -huh. That's why I used to look at some of these people I call miseducated. Uh -huh. They went to an education and knew nothing. Uh -huh. And in fact, they were miseducated because as we understand now, that was part of the system anyway, to miseducate you. Uh -huh. So you could be fulfill a niche in a wheel that was grinding you under. Mm -hmm. but not to give you, you see, knowledge is wisdom. Wisdom will not let you serve. Wisdom will always keep you thinking, and it's just a matter of time before you break away from any oppressor or master or anything else. Mm -hmm. So they'll never give you wisdom, and if you're trying to oppress the people, you'd never give wisdom either. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is something you have to learn. Education and knowledge is something you have to desire. Mm -hmm. If you get both, then I find there are intervening forces that will help you, mm -hmm. that will talk to you, that will guide you. But if you're too dumb to even get into that vein, then we wander aimlessly, like many of us do, searching for the wrong things and never gaining complete wisdom because we never have adequate knowledge. And healthful body. What kinds of, what kind of things, what kind of ingredients go into that recipe? Ooh. <laughs> well, it sure ain't soul food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Soul food will put your soul back, at, back out of your body and you'll be out there wandering around. Um, juice, juices enzymes, napropathic, um, what I would call nutraceuticals rather than pharmaceuticals, things that grow with leaves and roots and trees, just like it said in some biblical text and as it says in most books of herbals and things, things that will nurture the body, help the glands to function and create hormones, 
enzymes and so on like this, rather than things that will kill you. Uh, as you know, on Thanksgiving, many times we eat, and we say we had food. You can't call it food, because once you're finished eating, you're so tired, took up so much energy trying to metabolically process this, that you got to go to sleep somewhere. So if you eat and you get more tired than after you eat, you didn't eat food, mm -hmm. you ate something with no life. Mm -hmm. So you learn to live by taking in things that can give you energy rather than take your energy. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn a whole new way. What gave me energy rather than took my energy and gave me back nothing. Mm -hmm. So now I take about 28 vitamins and minerals and enzymes and nutropathics and things like this per day. Nobody else would probably do that except those that are wise. Mm -hmm. And like I was going to do your show, and I knew I was going to come around a person full of wisdom and intelligence, I took all my brain things. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I was going to do exercise, I would take things for energy. Uh -huh. I like to dance and all like this. If I was going to, uh, if I had been exposed to something, I would take things to build the immune system. Uh -huh. If I felt, again, that, uh, you know, whatever was necessary, once you give your body the base, then you try to add what it is for that day that you're going to do. Uh -huh. But I found out that the things that most people are calling food weren't. Uh -huh. And I haven't had a cold in... 39 years, and uh -huh. before that was a runny nose, because I know what cold is. I know uh -huh. how to stop a common cold or start it. Uh -huh. uh, I don't get anything wrong just about when I do it. You see, most of my things have come through accidents, car accidents, and that teeth knocked out and every other dang thing. But nothing from the point of view of letting my body go to pot. Uh -huh. So that was the wisdom that also came with studying under the field of metaphysics. Many of the things we're eating now are genetically, um, what do you want to call, modified, uh -huh. GMO. A lot of people won't eat meat, but they'll eat soy. Well, they might as well eat the meat. Because really? most of the soy nowadays, yes, yeah, genetically modified. You know, soy is part of uh, Illinois anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you the notice. The soy beans. Yeah. This that is why are being soy. grown and they're not organic. There you go. And so all of the pesticides and insecticides and chemicals that are used with everything else are used with soy. There you go. And worse than that is many times genetically modified which means that now they might have insect venom in them, they might have other things you wouldn't even believe that are in that soy, uh -huh. yet people eating it thinking they're doing right. Uh -huh. I'll say one thing, the mind is something that I can never, I will never say anything can happen because the mind is so powerful a machine, a tool, that you can probably do anything and get away with it if you have the right mindset. Uh -huh. But under normal circumstances, uh, that will kill you and make you just as sick as some of the meats. Uh -huh because it's genetically modified. If it does not say on that, non-genetically modified, uh -huh. then you might as well be eating anything Well, it's you. getting increasingly difficult for people to even identify things in that way, to say something is organic, because now they have diluted the meaning, the definition of organic, so that all kinds of things that aren't really strictly organic can be included. And then um, that some farmers are not being able to say that they don't have any, what is it, BGH in their milk or the cows aren't given that, that hormone. So it's getting increasingly difficult to really identify in the marketplace those things that are, you know, not as toxic or not as, as, as harmful as other things. But what about the environmental factors? I mean, they're, the things that we ingest, certainly, have a major role, but then of course you got to breathe air. You got to you got to live in you know in in the the uh, current of electricity. You've got to you know these are things that are beyond our control in many ways. You said so much as usual, Dr. Peace. Um, not only are the foods modified: tomato, potato, asparagus. Uh, broccoli, cauliflower, almost all the basics are, purposely. And as you know, they have a terminator seed now, too. Yes. Because the farmers can't plant seed, you can't plant seed now unless you buy it from the government. They come up one season, and they're gone, which right. means they're already modified. Uh -huh. Watermelons down here with seedless watermelons. Uh -huh. I wouldn't even touch a watermelon with no, uh, with no seeds uh -huh. out. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But as you say, they tell me we have to breathe. Uh -huh. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. But if you breathe, what are you going to breathe? You can't call it air anymore. We breathe something that is overtaxing our body with toxins that we're trying to get through the day on. Uh -huh. People say, why do you take all that stuff? You're a fool. No, I'm wise. You're the fool uh -huh. because you don't understand what you're breathing each day. Uh -huh. We have 
chemical sprays being sprayed over 245 major cities in the United States and all over our planet now is an electronic metal smog. And I can tell you why that's done too. We have these Gwen towers that they have erected, which are also perpetrating that continual thing. We have heart problems, high frequency active aurora research project. We have ELATA over in Russia, electrified atmospheric discharge. We have ISACAT, European scattered radar uh, man manipulation. All these things are broadcasting billions, I didn't say millions, combined billions of watts of amperage of ionic electrified air particles into the air. So much so now that you can't even see. Children nowadays, and they're not kids, because kid is a baby goat. The goat god, the goat god Baphomet, they even trained you that way, calling your children kids. Uh -huh. Every time you say that, you're really adding to a bad resolution on the planet. But we are breathing now titanium, aluminum, barium, non-human T cells, all kind of other things is being sprayed from ships that aren't supposed to be there, because the government, the FAA, this, uh, what's this other, uh, the civil aeronautics thing, nobody knows anything about it. But every day, these ships are coming over, spraying all these major cities. So much so, and they've been doing it now for six and a half years that I know of, so now you're breathing all of that. So you have metal particulation in your system. You have electrified air, which is poisonous in your system. And then whatever else, the smokestacks and the exhaust from cars are there too. Unless you can clean that out, your body's not only going to age very quickly, the cells are going to deteriorate and you're not going to function on the heights you should be. That's why most people are running around dumb to, uh, I call them comatose, dumbed down, brainwashed, vaccinated, inoculated, and encrypted. Any two of which makes you in, in, un, 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 unusable to a society that's trying to develop. Everybody either got that. Dumbed down, comatose, brainwashed, vaccinated, inoculated, and encrypted. You are going to have to say something about encrypted. Because we know the rest of those. Okay. We may not know to the extent, but we know those. We've heard those names before. But encrypted is? Chipped. Mm-hmm. You go to the wrong, I shouldn't even say this on TV. Let's put it away. Wrong lab that's making a prosthetic device, whether it be from your teeth or legs, they probably put a chip in. Mm-hmm. Unless you're very careful. Uh, the food you eat is probably encrypted. If you have any vaccinated, you are encrypted. If you're in armed services, you're encrypted. Uh, they're trying to control a whole populace, and this is the best way to do it. Anytime anybody invades underneath your skin, nine times out of ten now, you're encrypted. If you're not encrypted, you're probably mind control. And it's the easiest thing to hypnotize. You know, I studied hypnosis for about eight years. I could hypnotize anybody, give me ten minutes. Don't and do with it. A, when, with I got to finish this show. No, and with a drug, and they can give you the drug, you have no resistance, you will be hypnotized. In fact, the more you think about not being hypnotized, mm -hmm. the more it's easy to do it. Mm -hmm because you're fighting. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on now, uh, Doc, to, uh, I sound like I am psychotic. I am not. And I'll never say I'm crazy, I'm not. I'm neurotic. Mm -hmm. My neurosis grows with the psychotic behavior of people and the apathy of people, the ennui of people who don't seem to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's frightening to me mm -hmm. because we're a planet trying to come under control. We're a populace, black and white, brown and yellow, that is under mind control, dying right off the bat, being experimented with, and we still don't get it. Mm -hmm. So with all that in mind, it becomes interesting to watch people go around. I kind of retreated from folks for a while there too because I learned all of this. I said, well, I'm going to get into heavier stuff, almost like a, Bud a Buddhist or so, or a Zen Buddhist. I said, maybe they'll invite me to a monastery. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and my wife died in 2003. We're very, very, very close. I am just so Oh, that hurt me to my heart. To uh, hear that. 14 months, I couldn't do anything. I was devastated. If ever you met your soulmate, I was fortunate enough. Not, this was not the wife that said, what did you see there? Okay, that one ended about <laughs> four years later. This was a long-lasting thing there. And so once that happened, before that time, I was going to retire. I'd found my happiness. I had enough income. I prepared for that. I knew my metaphysics, and I wanted to travel with her. Uh, she liked to dance, I liked to dance, and nearly just see life from a different perspective, because I was not at all attracted to what everybody else was any longer attracted to, and I was thankful to the Creator for this. Well, it's like I still had work to do. As I'm about to retire and be happy, didn't care what anybody else thought, boom, they took her. My mother raised me. Uh, my father didn't want me. My mother raised me. And my mother died 17 and a half months before my wife died. Mm -hmm. So I lost the two women in my life that meant the most to me in the space of less than two years. Mm -hmm. So that's when people, what up, Nibler? 
Blair was already going to retire, then I couldn't do anything. I was so hurt, angry, you know, I couldn't understand. So from that one, it came that I still had more to do. They were at peace because they didn't have more to do. Mm -hmm. And to stop worrying about them, they were fine. Start to do what you're supposed to do, and that's why you're still here. Mm -hmm. So now I do things like people like yourself, as you've always been in my corner, and I do appreciate you for that. I do TV shows, I do radio shows. I do a lot of traveling, lecturing topics again, and, uh, and I still back and holding, not classes, but lectures. That's about it. You had a radio show on WBEE, I remember, because I had yeah. one there, too, yeah. and used to come on with that ominous music. <laughs> was it ominous? <laughs> it was ominous okay, music. It was ominous. And, uh, and have a, a lecture and a lot of call-ins and what have you. How long, how long was that radio show? How long did you have it? Well, you see, I had two shows. Oh, I didn't know the that. The Metaphysics Speaks I did at W.E., well, they closed, well, E-A-W-O-J -O out of Evanston. Mm -hmm. Then I went to W.N.I.B. on F.M. Mm -hmm. That was with Metaphysics Speaks. Okay. When I went into Opinion, which was, uh, again, thanks to Charles Durrell mm -hmm. out there, that was a talk show, Opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk show, we talked about everything mm -hmm. we could think about. Mm -hmm. And that was on for a couple hours on Saturday. But the Metaphysical shows I had for about three and a half years, and that was into the more mystical where I did, uh, they had astrology, numerology. I told this weird story. Mm -hmm. I would uh, play music that was a little bit different, mm -hmm. and then I'd also get into questions and all from the audience. Mm -hmm. That was the one I really loved because it was, it preceded almost all these other shows. Mm -hmm. Here I was a black guy that started it, mm -hmm. and then of course now everybody's into it. Nobody was into it then. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our group took place at McCormick Place when Yuri Geller and it was this Irene Hughes were there. Mm -hmm. We were the third largest group there took up three halls in McCormick Place, which cost us about, at that time, about $9,000. Mm -hmm. And we were making that much money in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been at that a little while, too. What's this on your, what's this bracelet? I always watch you very <laughs> closely, because I know everything has a meaning. This is $4,000 worth of magnetism on my arm. Okay. This Why is, are uh, you wearing $4,000 worth of magnetism? Not $4,000, $4,000. Oh, okay. The magnets give me they're magnetizing my blood as it flows underneath my veins. Okay. That will boost my, and I also take monatomic gold, that will boost my blood energy, not pressure, mm -hmm. to a point where bacteria and all can't very successfully live in it. Mm -hmm. This also helps my brain to function on the different octaves. I can go into different states because you're getting more magnetism than most people do. Mm -hmm. Magnetism works with the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, and the hypothalamus. It works with the planetary field. Electricity short circuits you, and when you get this alternating current, you can't think straight. It begins to slow down your body's ability to function and your brain's ability to concentrate, especially your psychic power. Mm -hmm. So in the more magnetism you can get up to a point, it's like a recharge for the spirit, for the psychic self. And uh, you have that yourself? I mean, do you, do you, is that a product that you have? Yeah, it's one of the products that we do utilize. Okay. And, uh, everybody so in the center pretty all much these it. all these things that you find, um, the uh, you find as as uh, as potential p potentially harmful elements in the environment, then you go search out solutions. The, the solution to it. There you go. Okay. Why well, know if you're not going to do something about it? So I don't believe in learning and then not trying to make things better for myself. Do I you, love me, so that's Have it. you ever believed that there was something about which you could do nothing? No. No, okay. There, it's only because of my ignorance, and I don't like to be ignorant, so I keep searching and praying and asking, and usually I'm guided. Okay, now what's the third thing that the medicine was, was for? For peaceful, peace of mind, for a healthy body, and the third thing? Understanding of life. Understanding of life. Now, that's broad. That's broad. Mm -hmm. and, and how do you, what? <laughs> Where? How do you approach that? Life is here for a purpose, and I'm in life for a purpose. The more I understand and seek that purpose, the more I'm fulfilling my life. Other than that, I might as well be dead, and usually people who reach that point are taken away because they're not progressing. Eight times I could be dead. I've had to say such things happen, it wouldn't, because obviously I'm now, while in a fulfillment stage, if you believe in reincarnation or not, I happen to, to get something physically done that might take, uh, it's easy to do it on the spiritual side. It becomes difficult to do on the physical plane because of temptations and things that can begin to get your, you know, your mind to go where it shouldn't. So as long as that's happening, I believe I'm fulfilling a purpose. I think it's half because of what I volunteered for, 
have because what they made me do, but at least when I can tell that little still small voice, that conscious if you call it, lets me know when I'm probably doing the right thing versus when I'm probably not doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I get into diodes and things like this too. I try to find things that we have things that can actually take poisons and radiation out of food. Mm. Poisons and radiation out of food. They call the poisons oscillating energy because they have a left spin. Mm -hmm. Things that have a left spin take from you. If I mm -hmm. get some passes over your body left, you get weak as a baby. Mm -hmm. If I amplify that to the right, it will. Things up north of our planetary equator line spin to the right. But no, they spin to the left. We haven't even learned what our planet is. It's nothing but a big magnet. Mm -hmm. So once you can begin to understand more of this, you can begin to utilize these things, and things happen on a better way for you again. Mm -hmm. So I guess all in all, to look at all of that, uh, I use monatomic gold. I use magnets. I use diodes. Um, <coughs> all of these things, and I try to get the foods that already, you know, uh, the diodes again. I even sleep on a, a diode mattress. And what that does is to pull poisons and toxins out of my body. Mm -hmm. I know of no other device. There may be. Mm -hmm. I know of no other device that can do that. Mm -hmm. It will pull it. It won't send it to the liver, to the spleen, to the fat cells, or to the lymph system. It will pull it out of your body. Mm -hmm. So this is a way, you know, it's every seven years, every cell in your body changes. It does, but you can at least have it to stay stayed or to the good if you can begin to work with the magnetic portions of our of our potential. Mm -hmm. Well, now, it would seem to me that if you're taking all of these supplements and you're using all of these devices to maintain your health, that you plan to live forever? And what <laughs> do you plan to do? We know something about what you've done in the past. What do you plan to do with all this time that you are obviously going to have to, uh, to be here? I don't know how much time I'll have to be here. I'm always being here now because even if I were in a different vibrational rate, I'd still be here. Mm -hmm. well, people are seeing shadow people now. Really? People, oh, yeah. I, I turn to the metaphysical shows and all like this. People are seeing flashes of things in rooms, and they seem to be phantom-like. And so mm -hmm. that's because the frequency of our planet is going upward. Mm -hmm. Our planet is on what I call the ascension, going higher in vibration. Mm -hmm. When you go higher in vibration, you can begin to see things that you can't normally see before. Mm -hmm. They're discovering new planets now. Yes. Astronomers have now said no such thing as Pluto. Mm -hmm. It's not a planet anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, if they say it's no such thing as Pluto, they might as well say it's no such thing as Mercury. Mm -hmm. Because Pluto has an accompanying moon and an ice field. Mercury is too near the sun and is smaller. So if Pluto can't exist, what are we calling Mercury? Mm -hmm. Now they're finding, they're talking about a tenth planet. We found that on Apollo 15, supposedly. They're talking about something else coming from space. Some have called it Nibiru, or this kind of the planet of ascension, the planet of the crossing. We are simply raising consciousness, so now the vibrations of this planet will let you start to see things that were there before, mm -hmm. but you were too low in vibration to recognize mm -hmm. it. So many things are going to be discovered now. And you're also finding there's a battle going on now for this planet. And there are those who don't want this planet to ascend. They want to keep it in a backward way. And there are those who want it to ascend. Mm -hmm. It's those here that can begin to help and work with the planetary scheme that will keep this planet ascending. If they had this way, it would be over. You know, they had a report from Iron Mountain about um, eight years ago for the feasibility and possibility of peace. Can you understand? A study to see if it's feasible. I've heard of that. I've heard of that report. Well, that's it. You know the conclusion? What? Peace was not profitable nor acceptable because you must change the population and control it, the means of production and distribution at all times, and therefore you must have a war every 15 years. Now that's a heck of a thing for somebody to study and rent. And you know what they said you had to do? Get rid of useless eaters and growing weeds. Guess who the useless eaters and growing weeds were, according I, to them? I, 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 I'm just really reluctant to think <laughs> that you're about to say, you're not going to say black people. No. Okay. Poor black people, poor brown people, poor white people. But black people, especially, and Hispanics and Latinos later. Well, you know, poor and black people are almost synonymous. According to them. But you see, who fights your wars now? The poor useless, whites. The, wait a minute, the useless feeders? Useless eaters? The useless eaters and the growing weeds. Growing weeds. 
That's their classification. And they expend us like fodder now. Over there in Iraq now, what do you got? Poor whites, poor blacks, poor Latinos. I didn't say poor in consciousness mm -hmm. or poor in mind. Some of them mm -hmm. are poor in consciousness because mm -hmm. they haven't lived long enough. You mm -hmm. go over there, boy or girl, you come back a man mm -hmm. and a woman. Mm -hmm. If you come back insane at all, because mm -hmm. war is hell, mm -hmm. you know? Who wants to fight a daggone war? Mm -hmm. Well, once you get into that situation and you get all these shots, you know, that's another whole thing that Nurse, Nurse Joyce Riley has talked about depleted uranium uh, that's over there now. They're, they're breathing. They get these five shots, including hepatitis B and C. Mm -hmm. By the way, so I'm just rambling all over the place. They're giving babies in hospitals hepatitis C shots at birth. Why? Tell me why. Because they're going to be sexually active when they come out the birth canal. Because hepatitis C is for homosexual or actual heterosexual adults that are going to be sexually active. There's no reason for that. It's, again, to get control because of the kind of souls that are being born now that they want to get control of before they take control of the planet. That's a whole different word. Once you get these shots in you, your potential to stay spiritual on a planet is going to be cut short because now your body's got to work to try and stay healthy, and you can't become the psychic people like I met that can read your mind, that you can't lie to, that can see your energy field around your body, that will be directed to understand that when you go to sleep is the time to come awake because what you can do in sleep is so powerful that you can take over a planet in sleep. That's what they call astro. All of these things, all of these books, all of these, this knowledge and wisdom, this is why I say I wanted to study, and I did, and the Creator has been good to me. We now have lost sight of because we have been miseducated into thinking if you can't see it, touch it, feel it, it doesn't exist. Yes. And the unseen always controls the scene. No two things can occupy the same space at the same time. First lie. On this planet, up to seven to 12 things now can occupy the same space well, at the same time. Well, you know, the time. people doing the strain theory are coming to that same conclusion. Mm -hmm. They're talking about membranes. They say, well, now maybe it's not strain. Maybe what you have is like a loaf of bread, and then you have slices, and these <laughs> slices are membranes, and maybe you're in this this field in this membrane and right next to you although you can't see it is another whole field that you know that coexists with you and they can't see you and you can't see them and you know they they have conventions trying to discover of uh, the behavior of matter one of the things that they discovered and it's it's so interesting they, they found this, what would be a string of, of not particles, but something subparticle-like. So they decided that they wanted to separate one of them so that they could study it. And when they tried to separate the one, the whole thing disappeared. Every time they tried, every time they got to that level and tried to separate one of them, the whole thing disappeared so that they can't even they know some things but they can't study some of the things that they know because the the phenomenon will not be will not submit to being studied and I just say well look out creator quantum physics what used to be quantum physics has now been codified into actuality mm -hmm. membrane is a very interesting word it's memory brain Mm. Every cell has a membrane mm -hmm. and a cell governor to carry out the duties through the RNA, the ribonucleic acid, of that cell structure. Mm -hmm. When it loses it, it can become like an amoeba, a cancer cell, because now all it does is multiplies and absorbs from other cells. It's no longer a specialized cell. Mm -hmm. Our planet is a specialized cell. Mm -hmm. Our planet is a, a specialized special cell. I'm we are the little neutrinos, quarks, meson particles things beneath you. Remember, he used to state, I remember when I first took physics, well, what do you mean, call it chemistry or physical science. Mm -hmm. They had 92 elements on the table. Right, elements. right. Now you got 126 chart. growing now. Mm -hmm. How, so what do we know? The whole point now is that we don't know anything. The use of a microscope and a telescope at this particular time is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Because your brain will influence what you see mm -hmm. and influence the micro world by your very thoughts as you're studying them. Mm -hmm. Now, who ever heard of that? You can take one so-called germ, one bacterium, 
bottle it, and unless it's in, unless it's in a brown glass bottle, mm -hmm. and you keep out light and heat, it will change and mutate into whatever else the energy field, the sound field, or the light field make it do. Mm -hmm. They talk about one, but you know, this is where Pasteur was out of his mind. One germ for one thing. Mm -hmm. that, uh -uh, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. on, on this planet, things, are, it's almost like the movie Matrix. You remember that mm -hmm. Sylvia Short, the, mm -hmm. the black woman who wrote that, and the Walensky brothers stole it from her? Right, right. Got a law case going mm -hmm. with that one, too. She tried to show. That's why she became like the, the psychic in that show. She was a guardian mother mm -hmm. who was leading everything through. She was trying to show that we're in a box. And if you believe everything's in the box, your world will be limited to that box. Mm -hmm. You gotta think outside the box. You're so nice. You're so nice. <laughs> and if everybody would do that, there would be no box because the box would disintegrate around you. And because the planet is going to make that box deteriorate anyway, and you're going to see people dying like mad now. You might as get well. You're going to see people leaving here that between the ages of 18 and 50, prime time, they'll be leaving here because they're not vibrating right. There's no need for them to go here. They can go to the heavens and be of more use than they can here. Here are the warriors. Here are the combatants against the hybrid dracons versus the ones here that are supposed to be spiritually born. From about 19, and this is when I was starting my group, about 1970 to 1989, indigo children were being born. They were here to fight or flight. They were the warriors. They wound up being hip hop and fighting the air and boxing the air and looking ugly and cursing instead of out there for the battle they came here for. These controlling draconian type globalists knew that. So they started the wars and said, OK, instead of them doing what they're here for, we'll use them, let them fight themselves. And they did. But the planet has been so, the creator has been so, and I do believe in the creator. From 1990 on now, you're getting crystal children being born. Huh. Whole new breed. They, op they, they come out the birth canal with their eyes open. The spine is erect. They are psychically tuning to the mother. She's carrying first, second, and third trimesters. They'll read you like a book. Animals obey them. Fish obey them. Even insects will obey them if you have a strong enough field. These are the children now that are here, these old souls back here, that aren't going to take the foolishness. And if you notice again, too, it's a very, I don't want to go there on your show, but I will say this. There's an interesting headline that came out last night concerning uh, a movie that they're now coming out with. I know you heard about it. Going to be going to be introduced uh, Sunday again uh, about assassinations. Very interesting. You see, thoughts are things. And just as there are a group of people who are thinking, kill people on Earth, control people on Earth. So as you give, so as you now receive. The faster this planet vibrates on a new frequency, the more that stuff has got to go. That is reptile brain. Feed, fight, flee, and fornicate. Doesn't take a nanny mammal brain with psychic potential to do that. Any person can do that that's low in vibration. So as they teach teaching terrorism and feed, fight, flee, and fornicate, you've got to think of heroism and consciously climbing, constantly trying to tune to the universe, constantly understanding what you're here for, constantly understand what love really is. Understanding now what universality is, understanding what mating really is, because it's time now for those who are here for a purpose to stand up for that purpose. If you do that, you'll be here for a while. And you start out by asking me again, well, then what and how long would I be here? Not long. Uh, when I feel I'm tired of it this time, I'm going. Up until that time, I'll try to keep this body together. As long as they let me think and have a brain, I'll probably still be here functioning. When that's gone, I'm ready to go. But in learning as much as I have, I just learned there's so much more to know, and that's a quest. That'll keep me going, that'll keep me young, that'll keep me vibrant. And as I say, I've had to start a new quadrant in my life that I thought was going to end, but I find it just like, like being with you so refreshing, so motivating, and so satisfying. Well, you know, I, I am speechless because I'm, I'm trying to process some of this that you have said. I know I'll be playing this tape over and over again, <laughs> trying, trying to catch up with this conversation because you talked about the hybrid drac draconians. What is that? Draconians, dracon, the planet draconis. Okay. Uh, one of the earthly physical worshiping of dracon is the goat. Okay. 
And you see a lot of signs like this being given around. Watch where you see them. Okay. The horn go god. Some people say Texas Longhorns, you know, and all uh -huh. kinds of lies. Uh, there is a lot of things going on now amongst these globalists because the real reason that they're doing what they do and fighting these wars is nothing to do with petroleum, nothing to do really with gold or anything else. It's to get rid of a, a populace, to control a planet, and to push it toward, shall we say, the snake people, to push it toward the, the reptile consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in this galaxy, there seems to be reptilians, dracons, and then there seems to be the more advanced ones, the ones with souls. They don't have souls. Most eggborns don't have souls. Wombborns have souls. Mm -hmm. So that battle has been going on for a long time. On this planet, all of these things are now allowed to come together to see if they could actually work together. Mm -hmm. That's why we have so many seasons, arid temperatures, moisture temperatures, so many things here. Just to see if each one given potential could evolve to its own consciousness. And some just aren't going to do it. Others are awakening. But I won't say the experiment failed, but Earth no longer, they call her Lady Gaia, or Earth or Sean, or Saros, all the many names she's had, now seemingly has volunteered enough, suffered enough, to be able to ascend. Mm -hmm. So now to stay on this planet for the next, you know, they talk about 2012 and the end of the Mayan calendar, mm -hmm. that's another big lie. People don't even understand that. First of all, it's not Mayan, it's Mayan. And the Mayans didn't write the calendar, the Olmecs did. The Olmecs were Martian, Syrian people who came here, who were the original settlers of this planet, and who brought that fight here just like in Star Wars. Those were Negroid-looking people with the little caps on, had a lot of psychic power, able to levitate stuff, we're still trying to emulate. But now they've even twisted that, have people waiting for 2012. 2012 will be a point of new ascension. All this mess, we're in the throes of hell now. In 2012, we will have ascended enough where everybody else that can't make the grade will now have departed. We would have separated from the other Earth. That I know is way out the box, but for some reason or another, I'm supposed to say that today because I didn't think I'd even go that way. But I have such faith in you and respect for you that I will throw this all out, let people evaluate for what they would, whether they believe it or not, it's not even point. If I did anything to pique some interest and to get some people to thinking deeply, then I thank you for inviting me on this. Well, I think that you, you people can't help but think deeply, even if they disagree or oppose. But the, that, that's, um, for me, that's a point of departure for study. You know, if, if, if somebody is saying things that are incredible to you, uh, it, it would not be wise to dismiss them out of hand. It would be better to find out whether or not this person is speaking something r relevant or something that, that's uh, truthful, and certainly it may be something essential. You know, there, there, I think there are things that we can't afford not to know. You know, there are things that you, we, might, uh, we might get by with, with not knowing uh, a number of things, but there are some things that are essential uh, to know, just so that you can do the right thing if that's if that's you know in quotation marks, so that you can so that you can make better choices than the choices that you make when you are blind and you do not know what you are choosing. You know, you in fact, not so you can make choices that are presented to you by by forces that may want to exploit or oppress you, but so that you can create new choices, which is my favorite thing to do. Is you know, it, I don't. It's no, it doesn't have to be either or, or either this or that. But here's another thing that that can it can be. You know, I think that we we may have sufficient. Um, I don't want to use intelligence, but there may be sufficient spiritual energy among us to be able to tap into it and to be able to rise to the level at which we can solve uh, the problems that, that may be presented to us. We might be able to find a solution before the problem pops up. Like that ad where the, where the man has is been given the umbrella hmm. and he has the umbrella up and then it rains. Uh, or when they give him a, a banana and then the gorilla shows up, you know. Um, certainly we can't, we, I don't know. I think that to react is not as good as to act. You know, if somebody does something, then you figure out what to do 
about what they did. But to be able to, to do something from your own initiative before something has been done to you or about you, I think may be preferable to you know, waiting to see what, obviously there are plans. You know, obviously every day when you get up, folks are not sitting inside of office buildings figuring out, well, let's see, now what are we gonna do today? You know, in this country, in this part of the world, on this planet. Obviously, there are plans, there are short-term plans and long-term plans about the direction that everything is going in. Are we making any of those plans, Dr. Blair? Well, you used two words. You said create is one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you said long-term, short-term, and so on together. Well, I think you said long-term, and of course, I created uh, within there in my own aspect, short-term. I, really, I wish Saturday <laughs> you could come out to one of my presentations. You have uh, them still at yeah. your home on Saturdays? Well, yeah, it's my say home, which is really a pretty big place out so there. So now you got the you got the Meta Center again. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm doing now um, timeless travel. Okay. To really get into the fundamentals of the amygdala, okay. of pro and, and, and con, of understanding consciousness, and how we time travel all the time, we just don't understand it. Pretty soon we'll be able to literally do it again, mm -hmm. but that takes a planet that's a little bit stronger in vibration than this one. Mm -hmm. When you say create, that's just what you're supposed to do. We are creators mm -hmm. coming from the creator. Mm -hmm. We are souls in the guff coming from the soulless one because the soul automatically has let him or herself out to us as individual souls. Mm -hmm. That's why a soul has consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's why a soul knows right from wrong. That's why the soulless don't like to see that because they can't progress back to the soul of the creator because they're soulless. Mm -hmm. And that is where the battle has always been fought. So as you well can see, being conceived spiritual and in consciousness, you can understand that. Those who have been dumbed down, comatose, brainwashed, inoculated, vaccinated, encrypted, any two of which takes them out of a usable society at this time, can understand that. So they will fight the master's wars. They will fight the globalist wars. They will take the globalist shots. They will let the globalists in the state raise their children, and we all sink. But the point is, again, the globalists are on their way out. That's why they're acting so crazy, but you watch my words. Their time is short. Consciousness is long. Certainly, I, I have just been just uh, astounded by the conversation that we've had, and uh, just happy to have been able to have it with you. Thank you so much for consenting to come, because I know that you don't do frivolous things with your time. So you must have considered this worthwhile, and I appreciate you for well, being said my the, guest. As I said at the beginning of your show, you've always been a gem, you've always been real, and you still are. And almost any time you ask, whatever you ask, uh, I would try to be and do. Thank you, Dr.